Uh, okay, let's begin tonight with our Keith Gordon uh, conversation. Okay. Uh, he's done some great movies. My favorite is uh, Waking the Dead. Mm-hmm, and, that's a great uh, one. Which I was able to tell him. But Billy Kudrup, uh, Jennifer Connelly mm-hmm. film. What other films? Mother Night, Nick Nolte. Mother Night is good. Um, and he did the one, oh God, what is it? the name escapes me now. Um, the first one he directed. Uh, Midnight uh, Clear. Midnight Clear. That was great. That's an awesome yeah. movie. Yeah, and he also does a lot of work in television. He's mm-hmm. consistently behind the camera on the Showtime series Dexter. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's, he's, and, uh, yeah, he's great on that. Yeah, and he, uh, he handles uh, episodes of Rubicon as well. Here is Keith Gordon talking about all that and more. You worked on the last season of Dexter. Yeah, I've actually, done a, I've actually worked on every season of Dexter. I've, I've done eight of them so far. Oh wow! And I'm about to do my ninth one coming up in in like September. Um, you know, I love the show. I think it's really just wonderful and dark and perverse, and 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 they have an affinity for style, and they like when you do things with the camera that are you know that are fun, and and the actors are great to work with, and and it's been a tremendous boon because the frustrating reality is is getting independent films made right now is so difficult, and has been for a number of years, and is only getting worse. Financing is so rough that you know you see more and more filmmakers turning to TV as a way to both practice our art and make a living um yeah. and thank god TV is getting better and better and 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 so and although it's a double edged sword because i think part of why independent films are struggling is because TV has become so interesting and some right. of what independent films used to do for people you know give you stories that were morally gray or compl- complicated or grown up well now you've got Dexter and Weeds and Mad Men and Breaking Bad and and Sopranos and you know all these it's really interesting shows that really are thematically doing what independent film was doing and filling yeah. that void and yet with with the TV shows people can sit at home and not have to go out into a theater and pay money and have a babysitter and all that so I think the fact that TV's gotten so much better is wonderful I mean I think The Wire is one of the best things done on film in any medium in oh, yeah. you know the last fifty years. But it's also, I think, been harmful for independent movies because people like me sit at home and watch weeds instead of going to the local <laughs> art house. So, I mean, it is a double-edged sword, and it's why I think you see more and more filmmakers who are from the independent world doing TV because the material is really good and the characters are really interesting. Um, but at the same time, we're not getting to make our own movies in the same way. And, and, that's, and that's sort of frustrating and sad because there's a lot of really good filmmakers who are just struggling to try to get just a couple of million dollars to make to make something that they want to make. I just uh, I just saw an interview with uh, with Robert Duvall the other day, and he, he's going to come on the show next week. And he was saying, "Look, I got four projects. They're the best things I've ever I've ever read. Uh, none of them can get financing." Yeah. No, financing has become. I mean, it's been bad for a number of years, but but with the economic slowdown, it went from sort of bad to ridiculous. And now the number of actors who are considered financeable is such a short list. I mean, it's it's the same four or five names, uh, which makes it impossible because everybody's chasing the same few actors, and you know they're just overloaded. And and you can put together. A, I mean, I, I'm not going to name names because it hurts people. I but I put together an amazing cast on a movie, and was shocked that we couldn't get financing. I mean, it was people that I would figure we would have had no problem. And we kept cutting the budget and cutting the budget and cutting the budget until finally we just we couldn't make the film. But these were people who are I think of as movie stars, and you know it just you know. But at this point, unless it's you know whatever Tom Cruise or Julia Roberts or you know, one of a very 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 short list of people, financing an independent film has just become so hard. The DVD, new DVD sales are down, foreign pre sales are down. All the things that propped up independent filmmaking are just way way off. So. At this point, it's as much as anything, somebody getting lucky and finding some rich, whatever, Texas oil baron who wants to invest in a movie. You know, but it, it, you might as well go to Vegas and roll the dice. It, it, you know, now all the, all the old sources of money aren't there. Um, and it's why, you know, you got, I mean, I just, did, I just did a really cool new show called Rubicon that AMC is doing, and I had a great time. It was really fun. Um, it's kind of it's kind of like a the conversation, uh, three days with the Condor, Parallax View TV series, and oh, it was great. really fun, and and it was also I think because they had a director as a showrunner, this guy Henry Brumel, 
there was a lot of encouragement for us as directors to bring our personality to it and you know stretch the rules and try stuff so it was really it was like making a little film but like the guy doing the episode after me was you know Brad Anderson who's a fabulous independent filmmaker who I really admire I mean we're all kind of doing TV now because it's where the interesting work is and it's a way to make a living doing stuff that you can like I mean better that than doing some terrible Hollywood feature sequel you know I'd, I'd much rather be doing be doing Rubicon and, and, and Dexter and be doing, you know, Fast and Furious Part 8. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, well, I that, mean... That brings up two, uh, two quick sure. questions. Um, is there something... Um, what is creatively satisfying about working in episodic television that you can't necessarily get from feature film? Is there is there something? Well, there are things. I mean, it's it's tough because TV by nature is much more a writer writer-producer's medium, and it kind of needs to be. Um, you know, you can't be an auteur on a TV series because you're just doing one piece of a larger whole. So the person who's really the auteur of the show is really the showrunner. It's really the person who's looking at the whole year and creating an arc and making sure that what you do as a director fits into that arc. So it's yeah. never going to have the same sense of freedom that doing your own film will do. Although I have, although I will say that you know, doing Rubicon came as close to it as I've ever felt and made me want to say, look, I will, you know, I'll do your next, every episode next season for free if you'll hire me. Um, but, but, uh, but, you know, and, and Dexter had that, some of that too, where they wanted, direct, you know, really good directors to come in and, and add to things and, and push it where it hadn't been. But it's still going to be somebody else who's creating that overall arc. So it's a different kind of artistic satisfaction. It's sort of being, it's, it's, it's partly about being a really good craftsperson. And, you know, there's a frustration in that, in that it's not your baby that you've nurtured along for years, but there's also a satisfaction in saying, okay, my job is to bring my talent, but to fit it within what I call the DNA of this show. You know, I might like a certain kind of shot, but if that kind of shot doesn't fit with anything they've ever done on the show before and would stick out like a sore thumb, I can't do it that way. So there's there's an actual challenge in looking at the show and going, what? How do I bring what I do well to this, without undermining what the show has as its bones? Um, and that's an interesting challenge. And I actually find I find myself enjoying that, enjoying going. Okay, if I was doing a movie, I might shoot the scene in X way, but because that's not the style of the show, I have to find a different way to do it that's going to fit the style of the show better. And it forces me as a director out of what might be my comfort zone, and that's always a good thing. So that there's something in in, in, in being forced to whether it's shoot or prepare or edit in a very different way than I would do in a vacuum, that I actually find very educational. And probably, you know, if I can finally get the money to go back and start making some movies again, I will have done things in, on TV that I never would have done otherwise. And, and it will make me a better filmmaker for it. So I, I actually enjoy that, that process. I enjoy going, hmm, how do I fit into this without losing what I do well? Um, and I find that a really fun puzzle, um, and especially if you're working with, with good people. So, I mean, why I've gone back to Dexter over and over again is because the people are so cool that there is a real good meeting in the middle process. I mean, you can still say, I know you guys haven't done this before, but can I do a sequence in black and white? And, they go and, then, and they're open to it, you know, as opposed to them looking at you like, get out of here. I mean, I have done some TV, which will go nameless, where I really literally felt – I could have never shown up, and it would have made no difference. I've done episodes of shows and um, looked at the final show and, and went, if I had never been there a single day, it probably would look exactly the same. Mm. And that's a very frustrating feeling. Um, yeah. But there are shows, and it's particularly in the cable world, like Dexter, like Rubicon, uh, you know, and I imagine like a lot of the other shows that are the really good cable shows that are pushing the boundaries – where at least as a director you can you know they may have the they may have the base there but you can build on it and add to it yeah and can you net, network tv i have the feeling based on my experiences is a little more this is what we do this is how we do it say cut say action here's your check thank you very much i'm sure with, I'm sure with exceptions but but it seems like that's more the tendency i think so too but i also think that the past couple of years they've had an eye on the on the cable networks and they're they're dreaming up ways to catch up uh, at least I'm well, hopeful. I hope so. I mean, I actually feel like I actually felt like they were, and then they backed away from it, which I found very. Far. I think a couple of years ago, there were a bunch of attempts to do more cable-like series, you know, so, stories that were serialized as opposed to being mm -hmm. neat procedurals with everything wrapped up in one episode. You know, shows like you know 
the nine or you know there, there, there was a whole there was a rash of these shows that I thought were very interesting and that were more that cable style of storytelling where it's really like you know it's like Dickens did with novels you know it's a little bit each week but adding up to a much bigger whole but I, yeah. I feel like with the exception of a couple of really unusual situations like Lost that network TV has sort of backed away from that because it was hard to sell that to 30 million people at a time I mean, that's those need, those different. have to be nurtured. Those kinds of shows, and it's so cutthroat. They they'll take them off the air after a couple of weeks if they don't perform. There's oh, and it's, there's and none it's of that really, nurture. Yeah, it's, I mean, I was supposed to do an episode of Smith, which I thought was a really interesting show, you know, mm-hmm. and I never even got to shoot it. I mean, I was like, I was like scheduled to do number like eight, and basically they called me after a few weeks and said, no, the show's gone. And it's like, you know, wait a minute, it's barely been on the air. Yeah. Um, but 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 it is a cut- cutthroat world. I mean, network TV, and I don't blame them. I mean, it's the, the executives are only dealing with the realities that they're dealt, which is that everything is based on advertising price. Everything is based. You know, the, the cable world is a certain luxury in that if you're a pay cable station like HBO or Showtime, it's not about like how many people watch that episode of Dexter. It's do people talk about the show? Does it get awards? Does it get attention? And does it make people want to subscribe to the channel? So they can take a much bigger picture view and even have a show that maybe isn't doing that well. I mean, like Dexter pulls in a lot of people for them, but I know there are other shows on, on, on some of these cable stations that, that don't have huge numbers. But because they're talked about, because they get attention, it makes people subscribe to the channel. And that's, in the end, all they're worried about. They're not worried about an advertiser looking at ratings numbers in the same way. Yeah. Um, you know, some place like AMC has to sort of split the difference, but again, they still can work on it. I mean, their shows, you're only talking about a couple million viewers watching a Breaking Bad or Mad Men, and those, I think, are both brilliant, brilliant shows. But if you had to have ten times that many people for those shows to be considered a success, of course you couldn't take the same kind of chances. Um, you know, it's the same reason you can't take the same kind of chances on a $100 million movie that you can in a $5 million movie. So I think that the networks are always going to be at a disadvantage because they've got to make a lot more money to break even. Well, speaking of movies, uh, before I let you go, it, what, is there a, a, a film project that, that, you're, that you're nurturing yourself that you'd like to see come to oh, fruition? Oh, so sure, I have a few. I mean, the reality of it, and I think almost any independent filmmaker you talk to you know, will, will always have a few going on, especially in the last 10 years or so, because they're so hard to get made. So that if you restrict yourself to one project, it's very, I mean, you're, you know, you're just, it's, you know, at least you're buying a couple of lottery tickets if you have more things. So I have a few different things. I have, there's a piece called The Muse Asylum, which I've loved for years, which is a, you know, it's the hardest thing to get made right now in that it's a sort of grown-up drama, which is the thing that, like, sends people running and screaming. Um, but it's, but I, but I, you know, it does have kind of a mystery element to it and some other things that I actually think make it sort of commercial and the lead characters are young and there's a sexiness to it. But it was a novel that uh, Peter Newman, who's a wonderful independent producer, has done a lot of great films from John Sayles' stuff to Squid and the Whale. And he brought me the book years ago. I read it. And I said, this is brilliant, and it would make a fabulous movie. The problem is it can't be done super, super cheap because it's about different points of view. And cinematically, the way to do that is to shoot it with different styles for different sections. Uh, mm-hmm. So you can't just grab a 16-millimeter camera and do it all handheld because it kind of undermined the point. Um, so you need a certain amount of of money, not a lot of money, I mean, we're talking about a few million dollars, but it's not a half a million dollar kind of movie. And that's when we've been nurturing very slowly, and we think now we've got a sizable chunk of the budget from one company, but we still then have to find the rest of it and then put a cast together that will make everybody satisfied. So that one's on the road, but, you know, I teach a lot. And one of the things I always teach is that, especially in the world of independent films, getting from nowhere to close isn't the hard part. Getting from close to here's the check you're actually making the movie, that's what's impossible. So, you know, and so, yes, I think on Muse Island we've gotten close, but whether the, whether that next step from close to we're on a set is six months away or six years away, I have no idea. So there's that one. There's on the other end of the scale, there's a, a comedy that I, that I didn't write. In Muse Island I did the adaptation, but there's a comedy that was an original script that was sent to me years ago called Memu that I fell in love with at the time. And couldn't get anywhere with because the main character is gay and 10 years ago like nobody would even consider doing that it was like just you know, we're not going there um now in sort of the post milk broke back mountain world the fact that a character is gay and that and it's not even what the whole movie is about i mean it's just one of the things about this character but it is an important part of the character 
you know, now that's not such a, such a, like, we won't touch it thing. So, and the fact that it's, you know, accessible in a comedy and it's really about outsiders in a family. It's this kid, it's this guy who's, you know, he's gay and his grandmother's the meanest old woman in the history of the world. And it's sort of how they form a bond because they both, neither of them fit into their, 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 their bigger family. And it was just a wonderfully written script and it made me really laugh out loud. And, you know, so my wife, who's a producer and I, are now out trying to find that a home, and that is one you could do fairly small. I mean, it really is a character piece. It doesn't need a lot of fancy camera work. So again, we have what, we have somebody saying that they think they have the money for it, but the step from that to, okay, we're actually on location making it, you know, who knows, you know? Um, all you well, can do is keep pro- everything crossed. The process, it just sounds like 90% torment, 10% enjoyment, doing what it is that you have a passion for doing. Was, well, that's how, the how truth. Do you keep, I mean, the reality uh, is, I mean, you know, I mean, another thing I always tell young filmmakers or students or whatever is that if you're going to be an independent filmmaker, you're going to be a professional fundraiser who directs as a hobby. And that's the way you have to look at it. Because what you're going to spend your time on is raising money. That's over 20 years of your life, you know, 15 or 16 of it's going to be putting together the film, and only four or five, if you're lucky, will be making the movies. And and you just have to try to accept that that's the hard work. That's that making the movie is the vacation. You know, when I finally get to make something I want to do, when I finally got to make Waking the Dead, you know, nine years after I first read the book, that was the greatest joy in the world. I mean, that wasn't hard work. That was, I mean, it was hard work, but it was, you know, I I, I couldn't wait to go to the set every day. So to me, the real hard work was the years up to that, you know, getting somebody to give me the money to go do it. Um, making the movie was, was, was the reward. Yeah. Well, Keith, I've loved this so much. This has been great. And when, whenever uh, next season of Dexter or your next film project, please come back. Uh, I would be delighted. I'm, I'm, as, as a film geek myself, I'm always happy to talk to you. So, uh, you know, just know that I, I, you can reach out at any point, and I'm happy to sit and talk movies because that's what I do with all my friends anyway. So, it's just this it feels like <laughs> it, you know a Saturday evening with my buddies. So, you know, that's I, right. I, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's my great pleasure. So, thank you so much, and I, I will send you the links to the De Palma shows once they. Right. Once they get I, I'm really looking forward to it, and and I'm honored to be a part of it. And if you Thank do talk you, to Brian for them at all, please send him all my best. We haven't I haven't spoken to him in a couple of years now, and and you know, but I still I always speak of him so fondly to everybody because he was such a big part of of my education. So just yeah. let him know I'm wishing him well. I, I sure will do that. I, I don't know where he is with Boston Stranglers yet. I think is the one that he was working on. That was I last I heard. That's what, but I don't know if it was in production or if it was I I, I you know I I actually don't know. What's happening with it? But I hope to God he's getting it made, I and mean, that would be great. I think it's I think it's running into those kinds of financing problems. I, I mean, well, from that's what I'm reading. every movie. I mean, that's every Ugh. movie now. You know, it's. Ugh. I mean, that's even the studio world has gotten much more that way. Um, you know, I know everyone was looking at Inception, and thank God it did well because there was a perception. I remember I was I was I was in New York on location while we were doing Rubicon, and there was a big article in the Wall Street Journal, which I I normally don't get, but it's what they delivered to the hotel room. And it basically was saying, if Inception doesn't do well, that's the end of Hollywood wanting to do anything that isn't a sequel or a remake. Yeah. Because this was a big, expensive, original idea, and if you can't, if 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 that doesn't do well, then nobody's going to want to ever do that again. And so, thank mm-hmm. God that's done well. So, you know, I'm, I'm I'm actually working with Chris Nolan on a project, so that's kind of cool. I'm also glad for him because we've been I've been working with him, so I want him to be doing well because it's you know I'm glad for him on a personal level. So. Wow, I mean, I, I don't know of anyone that's doing better than Chris yeah, Nolan no, no, it's, it's, right now. It's, it's great, no, and, and it's. I mean, you know, I don't know with. I mean, this is still in such an early stage that I don't know what's going to happen with it or whatever. But uh, but there's a book that he had read and 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 liked, and somehow I guess knew my work and to, you know approached me about whether I would be interested in writing and directing, and so we've been sort of just really working on the story of it and all that, and and who knows when it will see the light of day, but it's been sort of a great thing to get to work with him. And, and he's got a young producer that he's working with, Jordan, uh, Jordan Goldberg, who was the co-producer on on, uh, on Inception, who's kind of the person I've been dealing with a lot day-to-day on it, too. And, you know, obviously, you know, having his name on something means that one, I actually think if we get it to the point where we're all excited and happy enough with it, you know, the chance of it getting made is really good because yeah. Chris's name has got that kind of weight. So <laughs> that's that's kind of exciting, you know. And, and, but... 
But, you know, it's a process of getting it to that point first where, where Chris and, and ultimately the studio and everybody sort of all feels in, in line on, on the story. And then, then we get to worry about the actual making of our part. Yeah. Well, that's incredibly exciting. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I'm always I'm – always, I mean, I brought it up. I'm always hesitant to bring it up because I always feel like, you know – Things like that, oh, they can fall apart, and he could, you know, yeah. what if he loses interest, or what if, you know, it's, you know, he's got so many things of his own going on, so it's like, I feel very, very lucky to be involved with him, and I also think he's kind of one of the few real kind of cinema geniuses we've got around right now, but I also feel like, you know, yeah, I'll talk about it, and then I'll get a call next week saying, you know, Chris has thought about it, and he's really going to focus on his own stuff, and, you know, and, and I, I, I couldn't blame him, but, you know, so you're always kind of, when those things come up that seem like lucky things, you kind of go, well... I'll kind of shut up about it and just hope it doesn't fall, go away somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to jinx it, but just just yeah. the just the idea that uh, that that collaboration that I mean it's 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 happening now is exciting. Whether whether or yeah. not the project comes to fruition. No, and he's got an amazing mind. I mean, he's incredibly challenging. I mean, you know, because I'll go down a road with the script and I'll get notes and it'll be frustrating sometimes because he'll have a whole new idea. But every time. It's because he's, you know, he's got a new fresh angle on it. I think it's why he's look. He, he, he his own story, you know, thing is he talks about it. How it took him ten years to write the script for Inception, and and I can believe it because he's he's that he's that sort of detail oriented and that sort of, you know, he he's never he seems like somebody. And again, I haven't gotten to know him well. I mean, I I I can't pretend that even in this process. I've had anything except just a little bit of his time, but my sense of him is as somebody who's you know ne- who's never stopped searching. You know that mm-hmm. he's never just satisfied with where he is. It's always like, well, can we go further? Can we go deeper? Is there a different way to do this that we're not thinking of? And you know that's which is very challenging, but but ultimately what leads to I think some of the, you know why he does such good work. 